carrier protein. Carrier proteins are going to transport molecules that are too large to fit through the membrane by itself. With a carrier protein, we are going to move a specific number of a specific solute across the membrane at one time. Okay, so this is where it requires a ticket. Um, I mentioned going into a movie theater, you have to buy uh, a ticket to get in. Um, same thing with uh, like riding the subway. Only people that have a ticket can go into the subway terminal. So carrier proteins are only going to move a specific number of solutes across the membrane at a time. Carrier proteins need to be integral proteins, so they need to span the entire length of the membrane. Carrier proteins are going to be material specific, so we are going to have a receptor site on our carrier protein that binds to a specific receptor. Um, and then that binding on our carrier protein is going to cause the protein to change shape. And when the protein changes shape, it allows the molecule to pass across the membrane. So remember, we have specificity. One transport protein for one kind of substance. Our uh, carrier-mediated transport is going to exhibit saturation limits. So um, the rate of transport depends on the number of transport proteins, not the amount of solute. And then also, um, our carrier-mediated transport is going to exhibit regulation, so specificity, saturation limits, and regulation, meaning that we can alter the activity of our transport proteins using cofactors such as hormones. So we've got a specific receptor site for a specific molecule on our carrier-mediated transport. Our rate is controllable. So unlike simple diffusion, our cell can regulate the activity or the number of carrier and channel proteins available. The number of receptors is going to limit the ability of a cell to transport material across the plasma membrane. And the more receptors that we have available, the more substances that can be transported. Okay. So carrier-mediated transport can be passive. When carrier-mediated transport is passive, we call it facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion moves substances across the membrane down that substance's concentration gradient. Carrier-mediated transport can also be active and so we're going to use active transport proteins. These active transport proteins move substances against the concentration gradient, which requires energy. Generally, when we use carrier-mediated transport that is active transport, we are using a protein that we call a pump. So if you think about pumping uh, water or pumping iron, you are using energy in that pump. We've got ion pumps and we have exchange pumps. Ion pumps um, are going to move ions across the membrane. Exchange pumps do a variety of different things. Generally, they move two items in opposite directions across a membrane. When we use proteins to move substances across a membrane, we can do a couple of different combinations. We can move one substance in one direction, um, and then when we move two substances, we've got two different options. We have co-transport. Co-transport is also called symport. The uh, prefixes there are going to tell us what is going on. Co means alongside or with. So if you have a co-worker, it is someone you work alongside or it's someone you work with. Um, the prefix sim means same. 
So co-transport or symport is going to move two substances in the same direction at the same time. So we're going to move both uh, sodium and glucose into the cell using the same protein. Counter transport, on the other hand, is going to uh, do something different. Counter transport is also called antiport. So counter means against. If you have a counter argument, it is an argument against the other person. If you are moving counterclockwise, you are moving uh, opposite of clockwise. Antiport. Anti also means against, so you are going to be moving two substances in opposite directions across the membrane. So one substance will move into the cell while a second substance moves out of the cell. And we can classify all of our carrier mediated transport this way, whether it is passive or active. We've already talked about passive transport with carrier mediated proteins, so now we're going to talk about active transport and carrier mediated proteins. Active requires energy, and again, we are going against the concentration gradient. So a good example we have of active transport is the sodium-potassium exchange pump. The sodium-potassium exchange pump requires energy to move three sodium ions outside of the cell and two potassium ions into the cell. Now I don't ask you to remember numbers very frequently in this class, but this is one place where we have to remember numbers. So three in a out, two K in. The way I remember this is by writing it out. Three, one, two, three, sodium ions, the chemical symbol for a sodium ion is Na plus, so three Na plus, one, two, three, out, O-U-T, one, two, three. Three Na plus, one, two, three, out, O-U-T, one, two, three. Okay, then two potassium ions are moving into the cell. The chemical symbol for a potassium ion is K plus. So 2 K plus 1, 2 in I in 1, 2. Okay? So 3 sodium out 2 potassium in. Another example of active transport is secondary active transport. Secondary active transport is a little bit more complicated than our sodium potassium exchange pump. It is going to involve a few more steps. So first what's going to happen is we are going to allow sodium to move into the cell and because of our sodium potassium exchange pump, we have a high concentration of sodium outside of our cell and a low concentration of sodium inside of our cell. So our first step is actually passive transport because we are going to allow sodium to move down its concentration gradient into the cell. But in order to allow sodium to do this, in order for that protein to change shape, we also have to have a glucose molecule bind to our transport protein. So we are going to, the ultimate goal is to get glucose inside of the cell. We are using the concentration gradient of sodium to move glucose into the cell. So that's our first step. Sodium and glucose binds to a transport protein and sodium and glucose enter the cell. But sodium is kicked right back out of the cell by our sodium potassium exchange pump. So the second step 
of the process requires active transport, and so our process is called secondary active transport. We use passive transport to move glucose and sodium inside of the cell, and then we use ATP and the sodium potassium exchange pump to move sodium right back out of the cell. This process is a great place to use some of our vocabulary words. So the first step of secondary active transport uses co-transport. We are going to move two molecules in the same direction across our membrane. Sodium and glucose move into the cell. The second step of our process we are going to use our sodium potassium exchange pump to move three sodium outside of the cell and two potassium into the cell. This sodium potassium exchange pump is doing counter transport. So it's a great use of our vocabulary words. All right, so we've talked about passive transport with diffusion and all the different kinds of diffusion. We've talked about active transport using carrier proteins and now finally we need to talk about active transport using vesicles. This is called vesicular transport. Vesicular transport is going to use vesicles to move material into the cell or out of the cell. Okay, we've got two options, into the cell or out of the cell. Let's talk about moving materials into the cell. This is called endocytosis. The prefix endo means inside. The word cyto means cell, so endocytosis is inside of the cell. So we're going to use ATP to move materials into the cell. We actually have three different kinds of endocytosis that we will discuss. Okay? Our first type of endocytosis is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis will use receptor proteins in the plasma membrane. These receptor proteins are going to bind onto chemicals called ligands. These ligands are going to bind onto our receptors and once we have enough receptors in a row that are bound to the ligands, our plasma membrane is going to invaginate and create a little pocket. As our membrane moves inside of the cell, the edges of the pocket are going to come together and a little vesicle will pinch off of the plasma membrane and move into the cell. This little vesicle is going to fuse with a lysosome. The lysosome will free the ligands from the receptors. Those ligands will move into the cytosol and our ligand free receptors will move back up to the plasma membrane and rejoin the plasma membrane to start the whole process over again. So that's receptor mediated endocytosis. You're using membrane receptors to move a specific chemical into the cell. Secondly, we have pinocytosis. Pino, the prefix pino, means to drink. The way that I remember this is uh, to think about wine, like a Pinot Grigio or a Pinot Noir, uh, you're going to be drinking wine. You don't eat wine, you drink wine. So pinocytosis is going to be cell drinking. 
our cell membrane is going to form a little invagination. We're going to form a vesicle. And um, instead of doing this around chemicals that have bound to um, membrane receptors, we're simply going to trap some of the extracellular fluid inside of that plasma membrane. Uh, this allows our cells to non-selectively sample the extracellular fluid. They're just simply trapping whatever happens to be present in that extracellular fluid. It allows our cells to be knowledgeable about the composition of our extracellular fluid, and it's actually an important way for cells to absorb nutrients. So pinocytosis is cell drinking. Our last category of endocytosis is called phagocytosis. Phago means to eat. So if you think about macrophages, a macrophage is an immune cell that eats foreign particles. It, it eats bacteria and cell debris and it cleans up your wounds. So phagocytosis is cell eating. Uh, this means that our cell is going to engulf large objects. These objects are typically solids. Our cell does this by extending pseudopodia. Pseudo means false. Pod means feet. So this is a little extension of our cell outwards. Those pseudopodia are going to meet and form a vesicle that pulls our bacterium inside of the cell. That phagosome is the vesicle that contains the bacteria. The phagosome is going to fuse with a lysosome. The bacteria will be destroyed and then all of the waste products will be pushed outside of the cell through a process called exocytosis. So we've got three kinds of endocytosis, receptor-mediated, pinocytosis, and phagocytosis. That's bringing material into the cell. In order to eject material from the cell, we are going to use the process of exocytosis. So the prefix exo means outside. So exocytosis is expelling wastes or products from the cell. This is going to be the reverse process of endocytosis. We are going to take a vesicle. That vesicle can either contain waste like our phagosome example in phagocytosis, or it can contain a cell product such as hormones and neurotransmitters. So this vesicle inside of the cell is going to move towards the plasma membrane. It will fuse with the plasma membrane and open up that vesicle to release those contents towards the outside of the cell. So again, this is how hormones and neurotransmitters are released from our cells. It's also how we produce mucus and how our cells get rid of wastes. One more small subject to discuss regarding cell membranes before this lecture is complete. We talked about um, just briefly that our, our cell membrane is a great barrier. One of the things our cell membrane is a great barrier against are ions. We said that the inside of our cell has a more negative charge than the outside of our cell, meaning the outside of our cell has a more positive charge than the inside of the cell. This is called the transmembrane potential. Transmembrane means across the membrane. A transmembrane potential means that there is an unequal charge across the plasma membrane. 
This unequal charge is due to the activity of the sodium-potassium exchange pump. So if you think about the sodium-potassium exchange pump, it is going to move three sodium ions outside of the cell and pull two potassium ions into the cell. If you look at the charge on sodium and potassium, both of those are positively charged, okay? But we're moving different amounts of ions. So after one round of the sodium potassium exchange pump working, you have three sodiums out and two potassiums in. You already have more positives outside of the plasma membrane than you have inside of the plasma membrane. Now, after 10 rounds of the sodium potassium exchange pump working, you're going to have 30 sodium ions outside and 20 potassium ions inside. You have 10 more positives outside than you have inside. So now you have a greater transmembrane potential. If we do this for 1,000 turns of the sodium potassium exchange pump, we will have 3,000 sodium ions outside and 2,000 potassium ions inside. Now we have a difference of 1,000 ions. So you can see how the outside of the cell quickly becomes more positive than the inside of the cell. Now there are many more ions and um, other charged particles outside and inside of the cell than just sodium and potassium. We also have uh, calcium ions, which is Ca2+, that are outside of the cell, and chloride ions, which is Cl-, outside of the cell. So we do have some negatives outside of the cell. Um, and then inside of the cell, we have protein anions. These are negatively charged proteins. These proteins cannot cross the plasma membrane, and so they are stuck inside of the cell, and you actually have quite a lot of them. You have more protein anions than you have potassium ions. So this helps us give an overall negative charge to the inside of our cell. Now, all cells have a transmembrane potential, every single one of them unless the cell is dead. If the cell is dead, then there's no transmembrane potential. But if the cell is alive, then there is a difference in charge across the plasma membrane. And again, the inside of the cell is slightly negative, and the outside of the cell is going to be slightly positive. When we have a very large transmembrane potential, then we can use that cell to transmit information through our body. When we talk about action potentials, that is the uh, transmission of information down a cell membrane, and we are going to talk about transmembrane potentials farther. The kinds of cells that do this for us, that relay information, are going to be neurons and muscle cells. And we'll talk about that in later units. But for right now, it's important that you remember the inside of the membrane is negative, the outside of the membrane is positive. This ends the lecture for the plasma membrane.